The nice thing about all three of those primary causes, it is that of all three of these primary causes, again, inflammation, stress, and elevated insulin, it's the elevated insulin that can be corrected so quickly. For example, if you had someone who you were a clinician or you're talking to a loved one and you found out that they had all of those things, high stress, high inflammation, high insulin, you would say, hey, your stress is high. You need to lower your stress hormones. Well, you don't know exactly how they're doing it. Or maybe you know that they're sleeping poorly and you say, I know you're insomniac. You have insomnia. Um, you're not sleeping well. You need to sleep better. And they're going to say, oh, thanks. Now I'm going to be stressed even more than I was before about my lack of sleep. And so it's difficult to really get a firm grasp on stress to turn it down. Same, same with inflammation, that if someone has an elevated C-reactive protein, for example, uh, knowing how to reduce that can be a little tricky. They might not know. It might not be something that they're even doing in their lifestyle. It could be a result of their fat cells, which I'll get to in just a moment. But insulin, we know what spikes insulin. And so it becomes a lever that we can grab, whereas the other two are slippery and it's difficult to grab them. This one, we can grab it and immediately start pulling it down within a day, improving insulin resistance as a result. Now, some of you may be thinking that there are some conspicuously absent causes here. For example, why haven't I mentioned seed oils? Well, now I will. Let's transition from the primary causes to the secondary causes. And I speak about seed oils with enormous respect and all sincerity. Um, the, um, the amount of papers I've now been introduced to, despite not being an expert on seed oils, is, is remarkable. And these are definitely contributing to diseases across the board. I just, of course, focus on my area of expertise, namely insulin resistance. There is evidence in cell cultures that linoleic acid, the primary omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid that constitutes linoleic acid, uh, that constitutes soybean oil and the other refined seed oils, that in cells, it can cause insulin resistance. Kind of. There's mixed evidence there. Um, next, in animals, if you have an animal eat a high uh, – animals will eat a high soybean oil diet as opposed to, say, coconut oil, the soybean oil diet consumers will get – um, more insulin resistant than the coconut oil. So there's something more uniquely pathogenic. But in humans, I've just never seen a study in humans where you have the person eat soybean oil specifically independent of any other types of fats, and then they become insulin resistant. That's why I haven't quite been able to graduate seed oils into the primary cause. I, th I believe it's contributing. In fact, I'll mention a reason that it might be a bit indirect in, in a moment with regards to fat cells. But um, the direct effect of just eating the linoleic acid, do you get it? Um, or do you get the insulin resistance? Uh, no. No, I've not seen the studies uh, on that. But again, I'll revisit that in just a moment. All right. Now, the other secondary cause of just two that I'm going to mention, and then I'll mention the last one, which is very unique, is uric acid. Um Thanks in large part to my good friend, Rick Johnson at the University of Colorado, the world has really woken up to the dangers of uric acid. And just as a reminder, as much as the world has focused on meat as a sole cause of uric acid because of some of the unique um, molecules within it, uh, fructose will increase uric acid far more than any amount of meat will. And that's primarily what Rick is focused on, this fructose um, every time you metabolize a molecule of fructose, you're producing some uric acid. So it's a heavy, heavy contributor. Now, interestingly, uric acid has been shown to cause insulin resistance in all three biomedical models. You treat cells with uric acid, they become insulin resistant. You increase the uric acid in the animals, they become insulin resistant. If you block uric acid production, they don't become insulin resistant. And the exact same thing is seen with humans. More uric acid, as you spike it up, more insulin resistance. You block uric acid production, insulin resistance gets better. It's pretty robust evidence. Now, why don't I put it in the category of primary? Because if you block the inflammation effect of the uric acid, there's no insulin resistance or you, you wipe it out. And so this is the case that I alluded to earlier where you have a trigger, a stimulus, but it is acting through another mediator. And that if you take away this mediator, so it's dependent on specifically inflammation. And in the absence of inflammation, there's no insulin resistance. 
so it's dependent. So uric acid causes insulin resistance dependent on its ability to increase inflammation or activate these immune path, these inflammatory pathways. That's why I put it in the secondary realm. Because remember, with the primary, all of those are capable of causing insulin resistance on their own in the absence of any other signal. They're not dependent on anything but themselves.